So today we're here to talk about maker spaces specifically and um, some of the lessons learned. Uh, and I'm going to have the people on the panel introduce themselves. I'm Bill Gardner. I teach digital forensics and information assurance at Marshall University. Um, and I also have a relationship with RCBI, and I'll let Jamie explain what RCBI is. Uh, but I've, I'll, I've worked in and around makerspaces for a few years now um, with different projects. You're on. All right, so yeah, I'm uh, Jamie Cope. I'm the deputy director at RCBI, which is the Robert Seabird Institute. And uh, we really don't have enough time to get into everything that the Robert Seabird Institute does, but uh, we'll just say the short version is we touch a little bit of uh, the manufacturing industry in just about every single way, whether it's quality or uh, shared manufacturing using some of our equipment or we even have an agricultural department. But we have a lot of uh, cool toys that people can come in and use, uh, high-end manufacturing stuff all the way down to our makerspace that we'll talk about later, which was called the Maker Vault, which is located in Huntington. Uh, my name is Tom Warledge. Uh, to make money, I'm an architect. <laughs> That's what I do for a living, but I'm also a maker. I've uh, been involved in, in several projects around town, and we're hoping to have a, a maker space open here soon, kind of a, a entry-level maker space where you can come in and make messes and try new things. I'm also uh, on the board of Create West Virginia. Great West Virginia is an economic development organization. We encourage uh, the creative industries, and creative industries covers everything from, you know, potters to scientists. Anybody who makes money using their mind, like you all do, uh, as uh, a way to move West Virginia forward, rather than basing all our income, all, all our economy on extraction and manufacturing jobs. So uh, this is going to be a pretty loose format. Uh, I'll start talking about some of my experiences, and you all can jump in if you want to, but we'll just basically take turns. And if you have any questions, just let me know. So a makerspace is a place for creative people to come together to make things, right? And usually the tools in a makerspace are things like 3D printing, um, yeah, we've got, uh, at ours, we have uh, several MakerBot 3D printers. We have one out there if you've never seen one or if you want to see one again. Uh, we have um, a vinyl cutter, you know, like if you're going to make the decals on the back of a minivan or whatever you want to do with a vinyl cutter. Uh, we have an X-Carve, which is a tabletop router. Uh, carves wood, aluminum. Uh, we've got a laser attachment for that that I haven't had a chance to play with much yet, but it'll burn in wood or cut cardboard, things like that with the laser. Uh, we have a vacuum form mold. We have a small one uh, that kind of like dental industry, you could make uh, mouth guards and things like that or whatever you wanted to make a mold of. Uh, and that's most of what we have in, in our makerspace. You guys got? Uh, we're just in the process of getting spaces and putting the things together but our intent is to be kind of an entry-level makerspace we're going to house a tool library at the makerspace which is not only for the makers but it's also going to have a traveling bus that we can check out tools to people who are rebuilding their houses so it's it's part of a, a, a broader community-based uh, uh, initiative uh, but the intent is to have a place where you can come you can put things together and tear them apart and uh, the, the one of the things about a makerspace. Let me let me define maker first. Um, a maker it could be it's basically anybody who, who likes to build things, and it could be it could be a chef, or it could be a seamstress, or it could be somebody who works with electronics, or woodworkers. Those are all classified as makers. Uh, in the old-fashioned term is tinkerer. Uh, those people who like putting things together rather than going and buying it off the shelf. Uh, some uh, the makers are artists. They make unique products and, and uh, unique, beautiful pieces of artwork. And others are just uh, there to to make something new. You know, see what we can do. And uh, and that's that's kind of where I fit in. I've made everything from um, a few years back. I I entered a design competition in international design competition for a solar product. 
Uh, ended up being top 50 out of 3,000 in the world. Had to build a full-scale prototype of the device I invented. And so I took over a basement of a, of a uh, makerspace and <laughs> built a full-scale model and sent it to China. Did not win the competition, but it was a fun, fun exercise anyway. So Tom and I were involved with, uh, I guess it's still a makerspace at RS, ever at EDC? Yeah, it's still, EDC is a makerspace. It, it is intended to focus on uh, digital media. Right. So it has a uh, audio, uh, audio studio, television studio, uh, places where you can work on computers. We built a, a pie wall. I don't know if anybody's familiar with a pie wall. Okay, over so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm the Tom. Uh, we built the pie wall, and it was working for a while, and then somebody hacked it. So uh, now we have to go reprogram all the pies, and there's, I think, uh, six, uh, 16 of them. So <laughs> we haven't gotten back to reprogram the pies. <laughs> we made the mistake of not uh, changing all the uh, passwords on the, yes. on the Raspberry Pis. And That's so that problem. That got us. So, um, you know, that. <laughs> We are we we understand that there are security issues with, especially Internet of Things products, which is one of the things I work with. Uh, but you know the whole concept of makerspace is that everybody collaborates together, and and it's a mostly open source uh, technology and software. So it's the intent is to be an open space, and so to to, to really secure that, you kind of limit the creativity there. Well, yes, but you know the the Internet of Things has become a huge problem. Yes, I mean, you've I got botnets running off of web-enabled uh, Internet of Things cameras. But uh, you know, part of what making is is also hacking, and you know, hacking in its purest form is taking something and making it do something it wasn't originally designed to do, which is also part of making. We tend not to use that term because it's now associated with criminal activity. Uh, we're now at a hacker con, and of course, there's is there any criminals here? Raise your hand. Tomorrow, huh? <laughs> huh? Secure WD today. Yeah, Tomorrow. Secure WD Tomorrow. Hacker Con. A... But it's still a hacker con in that we're coming here to meet to talk about hacking in its purest form, which is making things out of or making things do uh, things that other than they were originally designed, as well as the creative aspects. So my involvement in makerspaces have been make mainly through uh, Camps for kids, where I got to keep, teach kids how to lockpick, which was a lot of fun when they went home and asked for lockpicks for the birthday. <laughs> um, and uh, also teaching kids Python in the past. Um, and it's been a very rewarding few years. I'm trying to think how many years I've done this. We first started at uh, West Virginia State University at Economic Development Center. And now at Marshall in Huntington, West Virginia, I have an, uh, an associate with the RCBI. Uh, but it's it's also about writing code. So most of the people in here write code. And a makerspace could be a place where you can find a community, a user community at RCBI at the Maker Vault. We have a Raspberry Pi group that meets on the 15th of every month. What's the time on that? 5.30? 5.30. Open to anybody. Yeah, so just yeah. come. It's, there's no charge. And um, we've had people show off... Uh, different projects and they've all been very cool yeah we had a, a woman just like this week that uh she was hacking christmas lights basically uh she was she'd set up some uh some relays on some outlets and uh, her intent was to to compete with some of her neighbors who had much higher budgets right <laughs> uh about a month ago we had a, a there's a family of of hackers that comes to the 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 group and they had taken a, an IKEA table and turned it into a gaming system very similar to the one that's out here uh, in the lobby. Except it, this one looks like a console. Theirs look like a tabletop. But it was uh, it was very cool, and it was a, you know a project that the family did together. Um, ended up using a router to cut the hole in the table, and you know a lot of electronics, a lot of programming, and they had a great time and cool product. But their kids came to the camp where I taught uh, Python. Yeah. So that's hopefully helped them with their projects. Um, also, I have to say that Tom has worked on a project that's very close to my heart, which is a maker project, which is the solar project in Richwood, West Virginia. Oh, yeah. Can you talk about that? Um, we were, uh, Create West Virginia 
as I said, it's an economic development uh, organization, and one of the things we try to do is is demonstrate some of what we're talking about, and uh, you know, put our you know our money where the mouth is, basically. So. Uh, a few years ago, we tried an experiment. Instead of having a conference in Charleston, Huntington, one of the bigger cities and some of the conference venues, uh, we had said, okay, we're going to ask the, the small towns in West Virginia if they wanted to host a conference. And we, had, we sent it out to several small, small cities in West Virginia, small little towns, and Richwood, West Virginia was the only one that said, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll host your conference. Well, how how many of you have been to Richwood, West Virginia? Okay, there's. I was there's, born there. Yeah, <laughs> my um, family still lives there. You know, when my father w lived uh, in that area, Richwood was the place to go. Is where where everybody went shopping and everything. But it, it has gone downhill. And when we were there, basically all the storefronts in on Main Street were completely closed up. And what we did is we came in. Uh, I'm getting. I'm doing a long-winded version of where we're going. It's here. all good. It's all good. <laughs> uh, we came in and we hacked the town. Basically, yeah. was what we did. Was we opened up all the storefronts. We uh, brought in uh, a solar power trailer. We lit up Main Street with solar power. We uh, ended up uh, wiring uh, some things so Wi-Fi the whole town. We put Wi-Fi the whole town, and we had a conference in this small town. And we brought in artists and people to come in. We had RCBI was there with their uh, three printers, and we set up a little tiny maker space in town. And uh, we were able to, to show the townspeople, hey, this is what could be done. Your town could be this. And, and since that time, there are people that have moved into Main Street. And actually, there is a maker space now in Richwood. Yeah, there is a, a maker space. A permanent maker space. A gentleman a really from California man. ended up moving to Richwood, West Virginia, bought a storefront, started a maker space, and works out of his uh, little storefront. So it was a positive uh, event for the town. Uh, part of that um, project, which somebody asked me to do, uh, uh, Sarah and her sister, who are, are Create West Virginia board members as well, they came up with the idea. Well, let's let's leave behind a, a something permanent in the town, because you know once we left, when we left, we basically took it all down and took it with us. So we came up with this idea of building a solar array uh, that would light up a portion of the town. They wanted me to light up the whole town with a solar array. I said we don't have a million dollars, so we can't really do that. <laughs> So uh, we built a, a trellis system uh, that was made out of local hardwood, milled in a local mill, uh, and representative of the, the hardwood um, industries there. And then we put solar panels on it, and then we were able to leverage different grants and things to build a small park uh, called Helios Park. And uh, it's, it has solar panels, it has a lot of different uh, environmental uh, aspects to it that we are uh, it's now just getting completed about two years later but uh, it, it, it ended up being a nice little space. In, 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 in your defense there was some question about if it was going to be located at one location and yeah. moved to another location so it's not uh, I think a lot of the townspeople lost faith that it would actually ever it actually ever happen <laughs> but it's a beautiful um, if it's a beautiful space and it, it's a fitting tribute to uh, the work to create West Virginia did in the town of Richwood, and unfortunately, Richwood was impacted pretty heavily by a flood this summer. Uh, but they've come back stronger. I think that it may have been a blessing in disguise. You had uh, you had failing in old infrastructure. Unfortunately, yeah. because of the flood, that broke the infrastructure even further. Now they're going to have money to rebuild the infrastructure. So, in many ways, I think Richwood is an up and coming community, and part a big part of that's. Uh, thanks to Great West Virginia. Okay. Jamie, you want to talk about the Maker Vault, uh, which is an, an old bank vault, which yeah. is one of the most interesting spaces I've ever seen a uh, makerspace in. <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the, the RCBI Huntington location is, is on 4th Avenue, about a block away from the Keith Albee Theater, um, and it's an old bank building. And the, the vault was left intact whenever they did the remodeling, not because we were cool and retro and all of that, but because that big door was very heavy and they couldn't get it out of there. <laughs> um, so uh, I started at RCBI in January, 
and the the vault was just packed to the gills with files in those awful cardboard boxes, just full of that. And uh, they decided that they wanted to move those out and use that space for something. And uh, we happened to land a grant at the same time that was for a maker uh, space. So we were able to uh, convert it. Um, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, my boss is a little straight laced, and I mean she's great, but but you know always in a suit, always very you know, uh, recording business this, professional. Right? That's fine. <laughs> no, I, I would say this to her. I'd say, hey Charlotte. Um, but uh, so whenever I said I wanted pallet wood walls in the vault, she kind of looked at me like, what is that? Um, but we were able to make that happen. Uh, so it's it's kind of got a little bit of a different vibe from the rest of our CBI, which is very kind of industrial and steel. Um, so it's a little bit more casual, homey, um, comfortable space to, to create in. Um, and one of the things I wanted to, to, to kind of talk about, too, is RCBI as a, as a whole has a lot of resources. Um, and uh, it fits very well with, with a maker mentality in that, you know, you might have a really good idea, but you just don't quite have the 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 engineering expertise or something like that to bring it over the top to get it to where you want it to go obviously the makerspace is the pay, place to play and and to try to figure that stuff out on your own and we definitely encourage that but we also have engineers on staff who have a lot of experience we 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 do some things called early stage funding which um which allows us to give inventors a line of credit with us up to ten thousand dollars to create a prototype or uh, a pivot of an existing business or something that something new uh, with that money. So we've had um, a guy come in who does horse feed buckets, or actually he's a dentist and he has horses and he had feed buckets that the that the horses were just tearing apart, knocking them down, stepping on them, breaking them. And he said, look, I'm a dentist. Money is not the issue. I can afford the best horse bucket, feed bucket on the market, and this is it, and it's awful. And he had taken a caulking gun, torn it apart, and attached it to this horse feed bucket so that he could squeeze the caulking gun in and, and attach it to the fence securely. And he worked with our engineers, and we ended up 3D printing and, and using different kinds of latches and things and experimenting quite a bit. So he was it was it was kind of a a maker engineer exchange going back and forth and now he's getting ready to go into mass production on these horse feed buckets um, and that's not unusual we get a lot of that kind of stuff coming through the door um, a high school woman here Charleston Catholic developed this little three-prong thing that cleans uh, cookie dough off of beaters or whipped cream out of whisks and we helped her 3d print through the maker vault um, a flexible version of that. Her dad had just attached some dowel rods to the back of a spatula, but we helped her print a 3D flexible version of that so that she could take that out and shop it around and see if, if potentially there's a market for it. So so we, a along with the space to play, we also have some expertise and a little bit of funding behind it for the right kinds of opportunities. So um, would encourage anybody who's who's got an idea that they want to turn into a business to definitely come see us. And you also have the, and we were all there this year, the West Virginia Mix Festival. Uh, I, was, I was both representing the Raspberry Pi group, uh, the makerspace, as well as one of my students who couldn't come. Yeah. Uh, but there, you know, there is a design competition uh, associated with that, which you can win some money. Up to $1,000, yeah. $1,000 for the grand prize couple $500 prizes. Yeah, that will be, everybody mark your calendars, October 6th at Marshall University. Uh, we'll be doing our Maker West Virginia Makes Festival. And uh, like I said, like Bill said, there is a design competition involved with that uh, for, you know, most innovative uh, invention, things like that. Um, we ended up having over 70 exhibitors this past time. Uh, about a thousand folks came through. So uh, looking to do it bigger and better next year. This that was our third year. It was a huge turnout. I now I've never seen so many people. Yeah, yeah, and it was it about, was fun. Well, it was a fun yeah, day. It was a great time. 
It was very sunny that day. I did yeah, not bring any sunscreen or sun <laughs> or shade. So remember to bring your sunscreen. Sunscreen. Um, wow. The other thing about making uh, we haven't really talked about is soldering, which we're doing some of that over here. Uh, in one of our tracks is you can go over and, and solder and make blinky light box things. Um, and I think that may be something we could start doing at, a, at the Maker Vault. Uh, I'm, I've been soldering for years, but I kind of stopped for a while. Uh, I can tell you, one of my students who's here, Taylor, soldered at, uh, at DerbyCon this year and did an excellent job. She solders better than I do, and I've been soldering for 30 years. Uh, so you can pick up soldering pretty quickly. You can make uh, devices, small devices, and then if you want to add microprocessors and add that on using Arduino or Raspberry Pi, you can make some really cool stuff um, where yeah. you can control the lights in your house or whatever you want to do. Yeah, I'm right now working on a couple of uh, IoT products, and one of them is a, is a light bulb. You screw it in. It, it, it detects about seven different kinds of hazards, and based on the hazard, it will change the color of the light bulb put an audible sound. But it also, since it's also a Wi-Fi server, it will also email you, text you, or call you if you happen, you know, smoke detectors are great if you're in the building, but if you happen to be at work and your house is on fire, how are you going to know? You know? Also, for people, we don't think about it, but people who are hearing re impaired yeah. can't hear fire alarms. They can't so. hear fire alarms. So this is a device that basically uh, takes that to the next level and detects multiple hazards, not just uh, particulates, but it What's also What's the, the password? Yeah, I don't have a password. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't but have a password? To yeah, it, it's not yet. Uh, if you want to work with somebody here uh, doing that, let us know. But we're using yeah. little micro, uh, uh, basically micro Wi-Fi servers that are tiny little uh, microcontrollers. Were you with us at EDC when we did, uh, we did a summer, I think, with Dr. Jack Smith, who uh, teaches yeah. at Marshall on Arduino and it took us like three or four months to build maybe three or four projects. Yeah. We gave it to kids, they build it in a day. Yeah, they're the same they're projects. Fast. And it's amazing how kids can pick things up really quickly. Same thing with Python. Uh, they picked up Py to the point where we're talking about doing Python for adults and what we'll do is we'll use the kid book. Because yeah. the kids book teaches you to do things that are you know, people like to do. Math, games, that's a lot fun than you know yeah. the other stuff. What part of our our makerspace we're we're going to incorporate a what I call the magic code school, <laughs> and we're going to teach different levels of coding, uh, introductory level you know of different levels of coding Python, but you know. Um, uh, Node.js, things like that, yeah. that, that uh, you know, it's useful for Internet of Things. Uh, try to get that as, because I think it's becoming, I'm going to get, get on a higher level of talk here, but, um, you know, the manufacturing, we went through the Industrial Revolution and manufacturing and all that stuff. Sorry. And uh, <laughs> all good. we no, have somebody no, here who no, this represented is, this a man. Is no, 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 he's the, right. The, the, we've gone through that where we have a, a mass production of, of one type of item. Well, now we have the ability to customize products, which is, which is great. And so instead of having, hey, you know, I need a certain widget to do this. Well, I can now design something and print it out and then prototype it multiple times to, to manufacture it the way I want to. Uh, one of the things that I saw at the Maker Fair, which I thought was very, uh, very inventive, and it's very simple technology, is a gentleman was taking plastic, recycled plastic, grinding it up, melting it down, extruding it, and making baskets out of it. So think about taking that to the next level where you uh, grind it up, heat it up and mix it and spit it out and put it in a 3D printer and now you're reprinting something uh, from waste products. Right. So I mean, you're doing something like that, right? Yeah, I've been playing around with that, yeah, that HDPE a, stuff as well. Yeah, yeah I'm a little bit of a... We're all, I mean, everyone up here is a little yeah. bit of a maker. Yeah. So the, the idea is instead of a mass manufacturing type model, we may be going to a small scale manufacturing model where you have a place, maybe like a makerspace or maybe like a workshop, where somebody comes in and says, hey, hey, you know, I've got this silverware that my grandmother had, and I, but I only have two place settings. Can you make me 
a dozen. And they could scan it, print it, make a mold, cast it, and remake that product or make something totally unique. Yeah. So you just think about how, how this changes the whole industrial model. Um, and, and it actually brings it to much back to more of a craft type um, scenario rather than an industrial scenario. Yeah, we have a great quote hanging up in our maker vault. Uh, and it's an MIT professor, I can't remember his name, but it's uh, not to make what we can find in Walmart, but to make what we can't find in Walmart. Right. So that's that's exactly the, the mentality. You're exactly right. I mean, there's there's always going to be a place for, for the large-scale manufacturing in, for some instances, but we're moving more and more towards customized, individualized. You're not uh, going to 3D print a car in, anytime soon. Eventually, we probably could. Th there are some so, that have been done, but yeah, it's not practical. That's the next thing I wanted to move to. So RCBI has printers that print things other than plastic. You have a metal extruding uh, printer in South Charleston, and you also have uh, other locations besides Char Charleston and Huntington. Yeah, yeah. In Charleston, we have a, a printer that prints in metal that... Uh, Titanium, stainless, uh, lots of different materials, um, and in South in uh, Huntington we have a, a printer that uh, prints in a powder form. We've got some samples out there. Um, it's 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 not really durable. If you dropped it on the table, it would break. But it's really good for getting uh, nice smooth edges and and you know like sexy looking art pieces, and it also does multiple colors. So it's good for like. Pre-visualization, things like that, that that you're trying to to show what it looks like, but maybe not something that you could, you know, use because it would probably break if you were going to do that. But. So the the uh, you know what we're talking about is kind of multiple levels. You've got the introductory level where people are just tinkering with stuff and rapid prototyping, being able to have the tools and the people there to help you prototype things. Then you can kind of take it to the next level where, hey, okay, now I've got a prototype and now I need to make it real and make it durable, make it, uh, you know, viable and maybe a business. And so then you take it to the next next level and they have the equipment to print it out on whatever material or whatever yeah. uh, type. And don't forget the there's always still the subtractive uh, manufacturing process who are machinists who are quite skilled that you can do um, quite a bit of interesting material things to do with the with the subtractive technologies, not just the additive technologies like yeah. 3D printing. I think that's what's great about makers and the mentality is is you know it's, it's all what your tools are. Uh, one one of the things that we thought would happen with our maker vault is that we could get people in and they could get comfortable with using the 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 less expensive hands-on machines and then eventually move to our downstairs which has like the big machines well it's kind of been just all over the place we had a woman who came in that i thought was like prime target for the maker vault and uh, she saw the four thousand watt laser downstairs and just went straight to that and started cutting uh christmas ornaments and mothman ornaments and things like that yeah. so she she's she plans on eventually getting to the maker vault but she's having too much fun on this laser cutter and probably making too much money um, cutting through stainless with a big laser, 4,000 watt laser versus a 3 watt laser that we have up in the Maker Vault. So it's all over the place. It's just what, what tools you've got and how you're going to use them. I, I think the other thing that makerspaces are good for is if you don't understand how something works, go to a makerspace. If you don't understand how TV works, go to a makerspace. Somebody there can spend hours explaining to you exactly how that works. If you want to take one apart, there's probably someone there brave enough to take a <laughs> Part of the television set. Uh, lock picking too. Lock picking is kind of hard. It's very central to the hacker community. When you take that outside of the hacker community, people don't understand. It's about solving the riddle and understanding how locks work, so you understand the weakness of locks rather than breaking and entering. Um, you know, you can throw a rock through a window. It's if you want to break and enter. There's much better ways than picking locks. Um, but I think there's a myriad of things here in, in the making community, as well as uh, 3D printing uh, and others. Um, so it's the other thing I'd have to say about, you know, Tom's talked about, it, part of this is an economy of diversification. Uh, I'm the son of a coal miner. Coal put food on the table. But coal is slowly declining, and we can have discussions about why, but 
we don't see the market for coal as we once did. In West Virginia, that's really a problem. Yeah. Because we have based our economy upon these extraction industries, and what we're seeing is now uh, a plunging state budget, and and we've just taken another two or three percent cut, two percent cut in state agencies, including higher education. Uh, we're operating in higher education on a shoestring, uh, probably not even a shoestring, half a shoestring at this point. Uh, and unfortunately, the only thing you can do when you in higher education is you have, you know. Nobody wants to keep raising tuition. Uh, diversification, diversification of the economy is very important, and part of the maker movement is to get people to see that they can do other things other than, you know, let's try to attract the next smokestack industry. We can't go, you know, basically manufacturing is not what it used to be. It's now very flexible. It's different. It's going to be a little smaller. It's going to be higher tech. So, you know, we're not going to get the next big plant here, and that's going to solve all of our problems. Exactly. And uh, this is going to be an uphill It's probably going to be robotically. But that's run. true, too. So, Robots are taking over. So, a there's, a, you know, there's another industry that we can go after that's, uh, that's related directly to manufacturing, but it is, a, is still a higher tech industry. I think my students are watching us on the live stream and just keep Snapchatting me over and over again. Do so. they have questions? Maybe they can no, ask. No, they're us being jackasses. They're just well, annoying. I'm just going to take this yeah. off. I think I'm just being <laughs> trolled. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? I don't even know what time it is because I've been worried about being trolled. Yes, sir. You've got a 4,000 watt laser. Could that cut two millimeters out of steel? Yes. I mean, without cutting through it, could it? Cut oh, you mean etch it versus carving? Cutting all the way through. Yeah. Um, there are lasers that can do that, but um, those are usually around like a 40 watt laser. So um, if you cut ours down to 10 percent of what it should do, it's still going to blow through it. Um, but we do have we have smaller lasers. Like so, we've got a three watt laser that might be able to do what you're talking about. I don't know. We could love we'll to experiment try. with you. That's yeah. where our milling machine comes in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We could certainly do that. The CNC, you know, I was yeah. to you earlier, but they took it over there and they okay. said the detail was too fine because the, the bit wasn't the small, bit's enough, small enough, yeah. fast enough, but they said you need a laser engraver. They didn't say they were one in Huntington. Uh, I might have had and <laughs> we're in the process of purchasing a 40 watt, which would probably do exactly what you're talking about. Um, I think I need to, so yeah, we'll do a little bit more research and talk to you about that. Thank okay, you. sure. You. Anyone else? Where do you where are you located around the state? Is it Dunning? They're they're located in multiple locations, and there are other maker spaces out there. There's the Hive, mm -hmm. uh, which is in Jim Beckley. Beckley. Uh huh. It's um, nice. I don't know about Morgantown. I don't know what's up in Morgantown. There's uh, what is it? The Launch Lab. The Launch Lab. Okay. Um, uh, we're looking at a space down on Quarter Street, so we're we're in negotiations right now with a man with a landlord to take over a, a storefront on Quarter Street. There's a there's one in Richwood again. UC uh, is going to have one soon, I hear. Um, and ours, ours is located in Huntington, but we have shared manufacturing with the big equipment. Um, Bridgeport, Huntington, and South Charleston up on Marshall's campus. And there is the one down on the boulevard, which is... Yeah. Uh, Digiso. Yeah. Digiso. Digi well, Digiso, well, Digiso, they don't know. Or, they, they don't call it, call it Digiso anymore. Oh, do they not? Yeah. Oh, uh, it's myself. the EDC. It's, uh, if, okay. if you drive by and you see a big circle that says EDC, that's it. It's a really cool building and uh, got to spend a lot of time in there. It's a really neat space. Yeah, it is a nice space. You can Anyone see my else? pie wall, but it's not that. And um, <laughs> at any of our locations, Bridgeport... Huntington or Charleston would love to have anybody who wants to just come in and look around and see what we have. Uh, just give us a call. Let me know. I got cards. You can do that. Um, or the 15th of every month. You know, if you can't make it there during the day at 530 uh, in Huntington, we have the Raspberry Pi group if you want to come and talk I do about tours after. Raspberry Pi or share, share your stories about what you've done with Raspberry Pi. And I would even say even if a Duino, which oh, yeah. is a similar device. Yeah. Um, We'd love to have you come. Does anyone else have any questions? I think most everybody's asleep. <laughs> yeah, we don't. I do that to people. <laughs> Ask my students. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Uh, and I will wrap this up. Thank you very much, Jamie oh, and Tom, for uh, mm -hmm. coming today. Tom, on short notice. Uh, Sarah Hofstede, who's the, what is her actual Create West Virginia title? 
Well, she is president of the board. President of the board of Create West Virginia. I'm apparently on the board of advisors, but no one's called me for a while. You're, the, you're on the board of advisors. Right. So, uh, yeah. Well, we'll be calling you soon. We call that a resume stuffer as well. Yeah, right? we'll, we'll call, be calling When's you soon. When's the uh, Create West Virginia conference this year? Oh, it, this year we didn't have a conference because okay. what we're doing is we're, we're getting re gearing up for a conference in 2017, and we're actually uh, tacking on to an – two national conferences. One is about universal, universal design. And universal design, it's hard to explain, but it's designed to be all-inclusive. So uh, it's usually related to accessibility standards, but it's more about, hey, you know, we're getting an older generation, you know, and some of us, after a while, don't, don't work so well. And so it's, it's about uh, making the spaces where we live accessible to everybody and do it in a beautiful way. Uh, so that's that's one of the national conferences coming in. And then there's a, a rural community development conference that's coming along with us, as well as Create West Virginia conference. So it's going to be a big deal. These are two big national conferences that are coming to Charleston, West Virginia. And one of the things we're going to have in this is we're going to have a hack the town type uh, scenario where we're going to go in and, and uh, kind of disrupt some of the um, we were we were already warned Charleston that we're going to come in and do some technology, either technology hacks or space hacks or things like that to make them more universal. Uh, oh, well, I know in, in Richwood uh, there was a team that went down to look at how do you stop the next flood, and they were talking about things like porous concrete. Right. So build back, build back better and different. Yeah. So that when you have these sort of traumatic uh, weather events, you're better, better able to withstand them. Re resiliency. Yeah. yeah. But there's also things like um, one of the things I'm working on for this conference is a, is a talking signage system where uh, solar powered small little audio devices that if you walk within a meter of them, they tell you where you are. So if you can't read the signs, it'll tell you. So if you're walking downtown, somebody who's navigating... Charleston for the first time, or even the mall for the first time, could be able to listen to these devices and start making a mental map of where they are if they can't see or if they're visually impaired. Thanks, everybody. Is there any more questions? One last time for questions. Thanks, everyone, today, Thanks. and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.